this little guy I call him Skeeter you know just because he's supposed to look like a mosquito you know but he was just so small that he was kind of got buried in the back you know before I cleaned and reorganized I'll show you what I'm talking about later on in the video but yeah he's just so adorable I kind of had to move him out to the forefront you know and then this little one uh, I don't have a name for him or her I uh, I can't tell but uh, yeah, it's just not only is it just plain adorable to look at, but uh, listen to this. Is the is, really? Isn't he cute? one and all and welcome to Tom's Hit Parade. I am just jazzed and stoked and pumped and all kinds of enthused to talk about what I'm going to talk to you guys about today. Uh, in a way this video has been like three months, almost four months in the making and I'll explain what I mean by that in a few minutes here. But yeah this is a sequel of sorts to my room tour video uh, which I'd kind of been thinking about doing ever since I did my last room tour video. Uh, was it three months ago, four months ago, something like that. But uh, a couple of things have happened recently, which is basically the, the core subject of this video, that finally tempted me to actually do this little sequel here. Uh, this video is centering on my AV setup uh, in particular, uh, which has undergone some changes in the last few months, uh, some of which I hinted in my first room tour video might happen in the near future, and spoiler alert, they did. Uh, yes, my AV setup has undergone two subtractions, an addition, and a swap out. That I'm going to talk about here today. So let's begin the story where else but in the middle. Now back in September I bought a video capture device which I was able to you know hook my VCR up to my computer with and digitize our slowly deteriorating collection of VHS tapes uh, while we still could you know before they be became completely uh, unwatchable. And yeah I spent three weeks capturing all that we cared to capture and this was oh gosh probably 25, 30, 40 hours worth of stuff all, all told. And uh, when I was done, that meant that I could get rid of not only the now useless VCR, but also all of those old videotapes, which freed up a whole bunch of shelf space. And as you may or may not recall, uh, possibly getting rid of the VCR was one of the things that I mentioned in that last room tour video. And I also talked about possibly getting rid of my standalone CD recording deck. And yes, getting rid of my VCR further inspired me to just bite the bullet and finally go ahead and get rid of that uh, deck as well, that component. And I used to use that to make uh, mix CDs uh, back in the day. I do several mix CDs a year for friends, you know, you know varying subjects and, and themes and whatnot. Uh, but that eventually dwindled down to just my Christmas time gift mix CD once a year. It was my favorite songs from the previous year. Uh, but now that I've gotten in so into YouTube, uh, I have much less time or inclination, frankly, to do mix CDs anymore. And when you think about it, it's, it's you know, mix CDs are kind of an outmoded thing now that you can just go and stream whatever you want to stream uh, uh, on audio at, you know, by request. Uh, and yeah, I hadn't used that deck at all in, in months, I think. Uh, I, it had only, you know, last few years it had only gotten use once a year, basically. So, you know, why not get rid of those, right? So anyway, that freed up even more space, uh, not to mention putting an end to the continuous electricity nibbling that all, all electronic devices do, not just those two. You know, when, when they're run by remote control, something's always on for the remote control receiver to watch waiting for a command from the remote. So whenever it's plugged in, it's draining power. So, uh, so anyway, I decided to have my brother knock out a shelf that now served no purpose so that I could move my AV receiver from the movable shelf that it was on onto that permanent compartment. Just, you know, it's a much more stable shelf for that uh, probably most expensive piece of equipment in my setup. But anyway, that was, uh, as I implied at the beginning of this video, that was chapter two of the saga. Uh, two other things have happened, one before that and one after that. Uh, so let's, let's rewind to chapter one, as it were. Uh, back in August, uh, the month before I did the videotape uh, digitizing and stuff, uh, my brother, who works in construction and remodeling, brought home some stereo components that a client had invited him to take uh, and do with as he pleased. One of the ones that he brought home was a vintage turntable. And now I had no particular need for a turntable. My Marantz is working just fine. So he just put it in our garage and we were going to donate it. Well, my curiosity got the better of me, so I went out to the garage, took a look at it, and it's a realistic model LAB440. 
Now, as soon as I saw the name Realistic on it, I was not impressed. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Realistic was the Radio Shack store's house brand, which much more often than not had a reputation for being substandard, not very good quality. But when I decided to do a little digging, do a little research, uh, I found out that this model turntable was one of the higher end components that Radio Shack ever put out. Uh, it was it was sold marketed in 1982, and it sold at the time for $220, which was a hefty chunk of change back then. And I looked it up, and $220 back in 1982 is equal to almost $600 today. So yeah, between the, the the healthy price tag that it had for its time, and the reputation that I found out online was apparently a pretty darn solid one amongst vintage turntables. You know, all told, I just decided uh, my my heart went out to it. You know. Oh, well, maybe it, my brain as much as my heart. It's like, you know, if, if this is a pretty snazzy piece of hardware, do I want to just give it away to Goodwill or something? Hell no. So I, I brought it inside, cleaned it up. And, well, frankly, other than just the regular dust and light dirt from years of what appeared to be careful storage, it really didn't need any cleaning, honestly. It, was, uh, it seemed to be very, very well kept up uh, by its previous owner. Uh, so yeah, and I, I hooked it up to my system for a test run, and aside from the sound being kind of muddy and distorted, uh, it seemed to work perfectly. I mean, the, the auto start, the you know, the, the motorization and the auto start function, auto start mechanism seemed to work fine and all that. Uh, but one of the really, really cool things about this turntable that just kind of made, made my heart and my brain go out to it was it has more bells and whistles than my much newer Marantz, my barely three and a half year old Marantz has. Uh, and it has an anti-skate control, which helps to keep the needle, the tone arm, from pushing toward either the right or the left side of the uh, the groove, so it helps prevent skipping. Uh, a pitch adjustment for fine-tuning the RPMs. You know, if, if it sounds like your turntable's running a little bit above or below 33 or 45, you can turn this little dial to uh, either speed it up or slow it down. Very handy little function for the people who are, you know, much more attuned to that than I confess I am. And it also has one of the coolest features that I wanted in this turntable was it has separate switches for record size and RPM speed uh, for the auto start function. Uh, for instance, when uh, when I set my Marantz to 45 RPMs, the auto start function assumes that I'm playing a 7-inch record, so it moves the tone, ar tone arm into the 7-inch position. But I have at least one album, a 12-inch LP album, that plays at 45. So and and consequently, I think uh, you know conversely, I think I have a couple of 7-inch records that play at 33. So it's very nice to have separate controls for both of those uh, parts of the auto start mechanism. So anyway, once I realized that, uh, mechanically speaking, the turntable seemed to be in perfect working order, I decided I was going to see if a new stylus solved the muddy sound problem. Uh, but I was, I mean, I'll admit that I was afraid. I'd never tried to do any sort of maintenance on a turntable before, so I was very, very apprehensive. I didn't want to do anything wrong, even though I didn't pay anything for this turntable. Still, you know. So I put it off for like uh, two and a half, three months almost, and then I finally decided to soldier forward and uh, do my research on how to remove and identify the stylus. Did so, and I ordered a new one, found out which one it was, and matched it, and ordered it. And it came sooner than I expected, and I carefully installed it, and perfect sound. Al well, almost perfect sound. It won sounds so much better than it did before. Um, there were skipping problems at first, but uh, tweaking the, the tracking force and the anti-skate uh, in a sp specific combination remedied those issues. Uh, but there are still a couple of minor issues which uh, perhaps, hopefully, someone out there with uh, major turntable experience might have suggestions for me about how to fix. Now, first of all, when I'm done playing an LP uh, and I take the record off, there's a huge amount of static, and that's something that didn't happen with my Marantz. So I'm not sure what's going on, and I don't know if it's the platter mat. Uh, it came with this rubber platter mat that looks like, I don't know if that's an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch uh, thick. But uh, yeah, I've heard about, uh, you know, I've done some research, but I haven't, uh, you know, pulled the trigger yet and bought any particular uh, turntable mat. I've heard that there are benefits with cork and leather and other materials. So, um, you know, if anybody out there has a uh, suggestion about what mats control static the best, hit me up with uh, suggestions because, yeah, I've got this rubber rubber one and uh, the mat that is on my Marantz is a felt mat, and I don't know if that makes a difference. I, I don't know if felt will get rid of the static problem. I have no idea, but anyway. Uh, also, the an another problem that I had was with the auto start function. The tone arm tends to move just slightly further in than it should. Uh, just uh, We're talking just a couple of millimeters, but then of course that can mean it misses the first 5, 10, 15 seconds of the first track. 
So I'm wondering if there's some kind of adjustment I can make on that, and I'm not sure I'm looking at it. And again, I am a novice when it comes to tinkering with turntables, so uh, hopefully it's an easy fix, uh, whatever it is. And uh, also, the sound is a little bit inferior to my Marantz. Uh, when you hear the louder sections, when the louder sections come on records, there's a little bit of fuzz, a little bit of dis distortion in them, but the quieter sections sound just fine. It's not enough of a distortion that it really bothers me, uh, but yeah, you know, is, is there uh, something going on? Do I need to tighten some stuff on the tone arm? Or, you know, I don't know if, I don't know if you can replace tone arms on this. This is probably not a carbon fiber, because this was made back in the early 80s. I don't know if they even had carbon fiber uh, tone arms at that point or not. But anyway, anybody has any suggestions, I would be absolutely happy to hear them. But honestly, when all is said and done, can I seriously expect flawless sound and performance from a nearly 40-year-old turntable that far as I can tell, still has all of its original insides. I mean, I think the only thing that is not original to it is the stylus that I put on it. To me, the awesomeness of having a vintage turntable that otherwise seemed very, very well taken care of, it's honestly worth these little imperfections to me. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm willing to, at least for now, put up with the imperfect sound just because it's just so cool having a piece of vintage gear here. Uh, but I have not gotten rid of my Marantz. I still have my Marantz. It is safely stowed away as a spare. Uh, it's actually in the uh, base of my Skip's listening station, so it, it has a place of honor, I guess you'd say. Uh, so yeah, just in case, I, I'm hanging onto it just in case this realistic turntable uh, ends up breaking down for some reason. You know, who knows what condition the belts are in. I've not dared open it up in uh, the case to look inside because I wouldn't know what I'm looking at anyway. But uh, yeah, it's, it's just so much fun, as I said, having a piece of vintage gear, and I'm really, really going to appreciate it. And now let's fast forward to the most recent chapter in this saga, as it were. Uh, and my Twitter followers, and I think my Instagram followers, have already seen me mention this. I think I also posted it to my Instagram. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was browsing around at House of Records, and on my usual survey of the freebie shelf on my way out the door, I saw a piece of audio hardware sitting on its back in one of the shelves, in one of the little cubbies there. It was a Pioneer CTW504R dual cassette deck. Uh, it had a few cobwebs and dust bunnies hanging onto it, and a handful of scuffs and scratches on its front from, you know, normal wear and tear. But otherwise, it looked like it hadn't really been abused at all. And before you come at me with the comments or anything, yes, I have said in the past that I hate the cassette as an audio format for its vulnerabilities, mainly. Uh, whether it's accidentally erasure by magnets, or stretching and tangling and breaking uh, due to faulty equipment. But for some reason, in recent weeks, I had actually been browsing around online, just curious to see what's out there in the way of cassette decks. Uh, was not really serious about actually buying one. But hey, when a free tape deck falls in my lap, what do you expect me to do, huh? Come on. So yes, before I realized what was happening, I found myself feeling like I was looking at a lonely puppy in an animal shelter, and I scooped it up under my arm, uh, double-checking with the store staff first to make sure that it was a freebie, and uh, along with a small handful of random cassettes from a grocery bag full of them that was sitting on the shelf next to it. Uh, yeah, I wasn't going to test this machine on one of my own cassettes, just in case it ended up being a tape eater, and I brought the machine home. And then I basically went through the same routine that I did with the turntable. I cleaned up the outside cabinet as best I could, and I, I went online and did my research on the best methods for cleaning the tape heads and the rollers, and got that taken care of, gave them really good cleaning, set it on the now empty shelf. You know, see, there was a reason I got rid of those other two components. I'm telling you, fate, karma, whatever you call it. And I dug out my spare monster audio cable, connected it to my receiver, plugged it in, powered it up, inserted one of the tapes that I brought home, and lo and behold, it works like a charm. And with surprisingly good sound, too. I was really surprised at what solid sound comes out of this thing, honestly, uh, which, which may be due in part to my thorough cleaning of the tape heads. So yes, I feel incredibly lucky, incredibly fortunate to have been able to adopt for free over the last couple months both a vintage turntable and cassette deck, uh, and f with what turned out to be a much smaller amount of effort and expense than I thought was going to be involved in it, honestly. Uh, so yeah, I, I thought I would show you a uh, series of pictures of what my AV setup looks like now. Uh, you'll notice the, the cabinet on the lower left uh, is fill filled with uh, record care supplies, which I've uh, accumulated over the past several months. And yes, that was the cabinet that uh, the old videotapes that I digitized used to be stored in. So yeah, so much free space I've been able to free up. Uh, little did I know how handy that all that empty space would come in 
uh, later on. So yes, I, I intend to appreciate and care for both this turntable and uh, cassette deck uh, as though I purchased them with my own hard-earned money for, for hundreds of dollars. <laughs> fly, Skeeter, fly. Oh, did I break it? <laughs> Shit. I killed Lammy Pooh. Now, as a fun little extra segment for this video, and also as a way of justifying my calling it my Room Tour sequel video, just because I haven't talked about the rest of my room until now, I thought I'd take you a bit further back in time in the history of my room by showing you some old video clips, which I would have shown you in my last Room Tour video, except I didn't have them yet because they were on VHS and I didn't digitize them until recently. Uh, as well as a few pictures that I did have but didn't think to show you until now. So here goes nothing. Enjoy this little trip back in time. Now this first clip is from around 1997, I think. Uh, it was before the big remodel, so uh, my room, yeah, the layout is very, very different, and my room in this video was about half the size that it is now. Uh, this is the corner in which I now film my videos. So yeah, as you can see, things are a lot different. The old furniture, my entertainment cabinet and stuff was its... Uh, floor-to-ceiling configuration with all the components in there. One of the most shocking things about this video is on the bookshelves that my CDs are now on. Yeah, books! What a concept, right? Anyway, uh, so yeah, there's some uh, videotapes underneath the TV in the cabinet there, and what's behind this glass door that you're about to see to the left of my TV is the first stereo that I had when we moved into this house. Uh, I didn't think to open it up and show it because uh, my priorities back then were quite a bit different, as you are about to see. Yes, this is inside my closet, and these white boxes, if you are not familiar, are comic book boxes. Yes, back then I loved comic books way, way more than I did music. I now have maybe 10% of uh, the comics that I have now. And yes, my music uh, that is that you're seeing is about half of my music collection. It was on the floor of my closet. How times have changed, right? And then fast forward to 2004, which is just after the renovation, so my room will look a little bit more familiar to you now. Still quite a bit different, though. Uh, yes, this display cabinet would move twice more. Uh, first, it would move over to where uh, Skip's listening station is now, uh, but then it would move back over to this corner at the head of my bed, and it now holds my Weird Al memorabilia. And yeah, the furniture is still in the old configuration, but as you can see, it's uh, my priorities have changed. The books that were on those bookshelves are now replaced with CDs, and that was my second stereo. It was so deep that we had to remove the glass door that uh, was uh, in front of it. And yes, this corner is where my uh, cassette mural is now, and uh, over here back in the first part of my room, over there in the bottom of the CD cabinets, you can see the cassette drawers. So yes, as you can see, my room has been in a an almost constant state of flux. It's been through many iterations of varying degrees, as kind of would tend to happen if you've been living here for 20-some years, right? Uh, but anyway, uh, on to, I'd like to show you a few uh, pictures, uh, partly because the lighting sucked in those videos. Uh, this first picture here, it is my room shortly after the 2004 video clip. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that I've moved the cassette drawers that were on the bottom shelf of one of the bookshelves that you in the video you just saw onto the shelf underneath my CD deck and my stereo, which is where my receiver is right now. Uh, but everything else is just about the same, including the huge, heavy, space-hogging tube-style TV and computer monitor. And uh, the white things on the shelves that are facing the camera, those are videotapes, in case you weren't aware. And uh, next we have a close-up of my old stereo. This is the one that I had for close to 20 years. Uh, I was hardly listening to any vinyl at that time, and uh, you know it just had a uh, an add-on, very, very cheap add-on turntable, bare bones, no frills thing. And I was starting to listen to CDs on my computer more and more. Since this stereo was starting to show its age, uh, you might be able to see a piece of scotch tape over the left-hand cassette deck. Uh, that was because it had broken, and the other one would break within, I think, less than two years. So yeah, not too long after this picture, the both cassette decks were completely useless, and then the control panel was starting to fritz out and all that other stuff. So uh, uh, jumping forward a few more years, uh, my CD collection in December of 2011, which was uh, very shortly after my brother had modified the furniture. 
And one, one fun thing to see in this video is that you'll notice that my CDs, and I'm talking all of them, including compilations, soundtracks, holiday CDs, and comedy, only filled about three quarters of the floor to ceiling shelves on the main wall. Uh, they didn't yet uh, need to use that crossover bridge above the TV, or the shelves under my TV, or the half height shelves that back against my desk. So yeah, that shows uh, in nine years just how much my CD collection has grown. And at this point, I still had my old stereo, as you can see, but I wasn't using it very much because it was malfunctioning more and more, uh, hence why I no longer had the main speakers up on the shelves. I just had the little, uh, small speakers, and uh, it was on that lower shelf at this point because that's the only place it would fit after my brother reconfigured my furniture. So, uh, yeah, in a way, I was sorry to see that stereo go, but at the same time, I wasn't because... As convenient as it was to listen to CDs on my computer, it was also a little bit limiting and a little bit of a pain. So, uh, And this next picture, which was taken at the same time as the last picture, was of my uh, very, very sharply dwindling cassette collection. You can see it's down to just one drawer now. And my small, but about to start growing rapidly, uh, vinyl collection. So yeah, that was uh, from both of those pictures were from December of 2011. And lastly here, we have a picture that I hinted at in the cold open of my video, my cleaned and reorganized menagerie of stuffed critters, uh, some of whom I'd even forgotten about that were buried in the back. Uh, yeah, why didn't I do that before I filmed my room tour? I have absolutely no idea. Uh, you can see Skeeter there, and also Lammy Poo, I guess. I don't know what I'm going to name him him or her. And uh, the critter on the elephant's head up there was a little fish that my mother made. Or, I don't know, it might have been a killer whale, just because it's black and white. Uh, she made it as kind of a test run to see how small a uh, stuffed animal she could make. So, uh, And incidentally, the uh, little fish or killer whale there is attached to the elephant's head with a safety pin, just so that it doesn't go tumbling off and getting lost in the menagerie of critters again. Or it could even potentially probably fall behind the cabinet that it's they're all sitting on top of. So then I might never see him again. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this little uh, updated and revised uh, tour of my room and uh, my, my update on my stereo components, which I am so happy with and uh, will uh, have enjoy for hopefully many years to come. But anyway, yes, that'll do it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends. And give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comments section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.